Yeah, spatial data infrastructure. First of all, hello, everyone. Um, we're going to start delving into spatial data infrastructure, which is only uh, partly to do with data. So you're going to learn over the next hour and a half and then the afternoon session, there's a lot more to SDI than just the data or just the technology. And in fact, the bits that aren't data and technology are the really difficult bits. But I'm assuming, I'm hoping that some of you will have been involved. Show of hands, how many have been involved in any spatial data infrastructure activity so far at national or regional level? OK. Well, this is typical, so it's, it's good. <laughs> um, I'm a member of the uh, International Hydrographic Organization Marine SDI Working Group, which was founded about six years ago, but only became really active about three years ago. The International Hydrographic Organization has now started to focus on marine data other than just for not navigation purposes, with a new set of uh, standards they're developing and what they call the S100 series which are based on international standards organization standards. I'm also a member of the Open Geospatial Consortium Marine Domain Working Group, which works closely with IHO MSDIWG, um, looking at the specifications that are needed. And what's happening with the OGC, it develops what well, we call them standards. They call them specifications. But it's an industry-driven organization. It's, it's, it's at 530 members from, from across the whole of society around the world. And it's unique in that sense, that it has priorities are set by some of the senior members as to what we should develop. Because without standards and without some sort of data harmonization, you can never have a data infrastructure, not an information infrastructure. And we'll see how that ties all the way back. And up until the 31st of October, I was also the Secretary General of the Global SDI Association. And it was until the 31st of October because we closed our doors on the 31st of October. Um, and most of the work we did do has been taken on board by the UN uh, GGIM, the Geographic Information Management Group at the United Nations, uh, funded by ECOSOC, which also now has a formal working group for marine geospatial information, which is led primarily by IHO. And we do try to work you know, together with, uh, with other organizations on that. Prior to that, going back 20 years ago, I got involved with SDI, and I wish I'd found some other topic at that time, but I didn't. You know. How do I make it go away? Oops. I can't use your mouse properly. It would be a Mac, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, beats you, yes. Yeah. Oh, much easier. Thank you. OK, so we're going to start off. Today we're going to look uh, in four parts at NSDI, uh, National Information Infrastructure, Look at some of the issues and challenges you have to overcome in putting in an information infrastructure. Then we'll look at some marine SDI developments that are taking place in a few countries. And unfortunately, it's very few countries uh, around the world. Um, and finally, the role that marine spatial data infrastructure can play in relation to marine spatial planning and marine cadaster. Just a very brief introduction to that at the end of the, uh, end of the session. And then there'll be a little bit of homework, but it won't be difficult stuff like you've been doing now. I just have some forms, some questionnaires I'd like you to fill in either during the homework session or, or later in the day uh, to return to us. I've been collecting information on how, how much people know about SDI and how much they have to know about SDI for about 17 years now since we started doing this sort of activity. And we're, we're trying to build up a picture on what's still missing from the communication aspect about spatial data infrastructure to get more people involved in it. So part one, national information infrastructure, spatial data infrastructure, and then marine spatial data infrastructure. Um, I'm not very good fancy graphics, so I've just used font sizes here. <clears throat> the national information infrastructure is what exists in every country, formally or otherwise. Today it is formally in most cases, which covers all information. It, it's embedded in the, or includes the e-government initiatives, anything to do with information at the national level. In that umbrella, you have the National Spatial Data Infrastructure, which is basically location-based data. So you've got lots of information being collected at national level and being shared and used both by government, uh, by industry, uh, by citizen groups, and anything that has a location attribute, the obvious one being an address, uh, ends up being part of the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. Within that, we have the Coastal Marine SDI, which are those data themes that are really directly related to the coastal marine communities. Um, 
what you'll find as we, if we look through this, for example, the INSPIRE initiative here in Europe, the infrastructure for spatial information in the European community, um, covers 34 data themes, a uh, huge amount of data being standardized and harmonized, and it isn't just the obvious data themes that are part of the marine SDI or coastal SDI, like hydrography or elevation for, for bathymetry. It's lots of other things also play into a marine SDI. So the real goal is to link everybody up by having access to shared information using standards, using harmonized metadata developed to an international standard. Because in the past, and even in many places still today, um, a government agency, an organization, a company will have lots of data resources, and they've recorded that using their own standard or their own way of recording metadata. Many of them have not even recorded metadata. They don't have any information telling other people what information they have, which is what metadata is all about, and what format it is in. Because if you want to share data resources across organizations, across government departments, you need to know what sort of data they have and what it looks like. And this is one of the issues we have to cover with SDI. So, first of all, national information infrastructure is not a, a thing. I mean, it is at the end of the day. It's like your telecommunications infrastructure. It does exist, but it's more a process of putting it together. And the first thing we have to do, and most governments started doing this back in the 90s, is to create information registers. In other words, looking at what information they had, trying to decide what value it had, uh, and then creating some sort of metadata, typically using a national standard, so that people could access that information or find out what it was. You've got legal mandates. Um, in most countries, probably every country, different organizations have legal mandates. You must do this. This is part of your job. It's in, a, it's in a, a law or a regulation. So you need data to do that. And that's, that data is required for legally mandated purposes. Um, one problem we have, and I've seen this in four or five countries where I've actually helped implement the SDI, you've got a government agency. It's got a regulation that you must do this. It collects data to do that. It puts that data into the format it needs to do its daily job of satisfying the legal mandate. And then somebody comes along two years later and says, oh, and we want that data in a different format to be part of the national information infrastructure. Um, and so there's always this extra work that has to be done in, in trying to harmonize things across government. Um, we need to evaluate the economic benefits and the societal benefits because creating a national information infrastructure, an NSDI, a marine SDI, it takes time and money. And people want to know what is the cost-benefit analysis. In fact, in the Inspire Directive that covers the 28 member states of, of the EU, soon to be 27, um, there is actually an out clause for any single data set. If you can prove using a cost-benefit study that it isn't beneficial to you to make this data set harmonized, you don't have to do it. Fortunately, most people aren't using that out. They're trying to follow the Inspire specifications, but as long ago as 19... 97, 98, 99, even before Inspire was thought of as a separate directive, we were looking at ways to value information because a lot of information has an, in, an intangible benefit. You can't say this is worth 2 million euro if we have this. It could lead to better decision making. What's the value of better decision making? So there are mechanisms to bring that sort of value into the, into the discussion. We have to establish the information policies. Um, I just finished, well, three years ago, helping develop the NSDI implementation strategy in Namibia. And we, we interviewed over four weeks uh, 17 government agencies. There were roughly 17 information policies being followed you know, across the government. That's the way it is. And it's the same you know, here. I'm not, uh, it's what we found in the whole of Europe, which is why Inspire came along. So you've got to come up with information policies that support the development of a spatial data infrastructure. Then you have to come up with the strategies to implement that, enact legislation to make sure that the strategies are followed, and along the way somewhere, you're going to be asked to do a cost-benefit study, a cost-benefit a cost analysis to say what's this going to cost and what's going to be the benefit. Now, we've done some research into this going back as far as 2000 to 2007, over a number of years, both in, in Europe, uh, for the EU, and outside. We've never, ever found a bad you know, benefit-to-cost ratio. The lowest we found was 2.7. We've had as high as 22. I didn't quite believe the assumptions in that one. But it, it's never been shown that it's less cost-effective to put your infrastructure in place than, than to not have one. So it has to be all-encompassing. Uh, it relates to government performance, 
And the real benefit is supposed to be increasing efficiency. This is the driver for the, all the, the national infrastructure uh, drives. It's supposed to increase economic performance um, and provide other benefits to civil society. Now, the benefit side, especially things like quality of life, security, welfare of citizens, how do you put a number to that? We were sitting in the office of the cabinet office in Ireland in 2005 talking to the Irish government about implementing NSDI in Ireland. Um, they had a law that it should be done, etc. And there were about 12 ministries represented, including the, the financial ministry. And the first thing he said was, great, what's it going to cost? And what's the benefit? Because he's required by law to do that sort of analysis before he can free up any money to actually start a new activity. And we didn't have any answer for that right then. Um, I, it's now 2018, and we still don't have an answer for that right then in, in Ireland and a few other countries. But the main point is that the national information infrastructure covers all information. It's not just spatial information or even marine information. It's all information. It includes media. It includes publishing. It's anything to do with information and the principles behind that. Now, the NSDI is... Spatial, it's, it's part of the NII, but it's spatial secondarily because it has a location attribute attached. Now, this, this, con, this term, location attribute, only came about maybe seven or eight years ago, nine years ago. Up until then, we talked about the geographic information infrastructure. It was mapping data. You know, it was, it was things you could show on a map that had to be part of the NSDI. And then, I think it was even the UK, never published uh, a, a spatial data infrastructure strategy, they published the location information strategy because the real key attribute to the data is the location. And that location attribute can occur anywhere in all different types of information, not just mapping related information. So it's not just about maps and digital geographic location-based data, although that's a key part. I mean, that's what you're trying to harmonize is the data underneath uh, your, your civil service your societal service. It's not just about the information technology, but of course that's key as well. Without the information technology, you can't access the new harmonized data. Um, it's not just about geoportals. I don't know how many times I've had people contact me and say, you know, we need to put in an SDI and we talk about, you know, on the phone for an hour or something, and it turns out what they really mean is they want to create a portal to show some data. Well, that's about the, this much of, of an SDI, which is this big. So I'll tell you an anecdote I, I do tell. One of the Global Spatial Data Infrastructure Association members was Asmat Ali from Pakistan. He was Deputy Director General of the uh, Survey of Pakistan. And he phoned me. I was sitting at my office here at my desk in, in Bredena. I live in, in Belgium. And he said, Roger, Roger, um, my director has told me I have to have the, GSDI, or the NSDI running within six months or I'm going to be out of a job. What do I do? Oh, Osmond, start looking at the help wanted ads because there's no way you're going to do an SDI in six months. And looking at our own information, you're talking six, seven, eight, nine, ten years to put in a full harmonized data infrastructure across all government. Fortunately, what his director meant was he wanted a geo portal running in six months. He thought that's what an SDI was. And they did have a geo portal running in six months. Now, a lot of the data that would be accessible through that portal was not harmonized. It was not standardized. You didn't know how to, how to use it, but at least they had the data available so somebody could access the data. Um, the key part of an SDI, and it really is, I should have had this in bold letters, it includes things like the governance policy, the data policies, the data principles, the legislation to underpin all of this, monitoring of the implementation and use of the SDI so you see if it actually is providing any benefit, which is one of the things that's included in the Inspire Directive. There's an entire section on monitoring performance. Um, the technical standards for the infrastructure, and not just data standards, but the services standards. You know, how do you, what sort of web services do you use on under, underpinning services to access the data? They have to be specified. So developers, whether it's government or, or industry, you know, business and civil society groups know how to write software to access the data. Capacity building. And it should be capability building, which is on another slide. The capacity building, you need people trained in how to do this and how to do the various aspects and how to take part. Um, and that's been a real problem because that takes extra time and money. Certainly at the government level, most government departments don't have. It doesn't matter what country you're in. If you're asked to give some, somebody a second job on top of their legally required job, it becomes a problem. It's unless you come up with extra funding. 
Very few countries have ever come up with extra money just for the SDI development. A few have, but not many. They basically tell you to do it out of your own budgets, because it'll be a real benefit to you later. When what the person sees sitting at a desk, an actual member of a unit who's responsible for the data set on, on ancient monuments in Ireland, um, this is part of their job. All they see is extra work they have to do to now harmonize the data and make it different. Their own systems probably continue to use their data in its, in its original format until they finally do the main switch over. So there's a lot of extra work involved. And this is where the people engagement comes in. It's people at the work face sitting at the computers who have to work with the data. It's people at, at the levels who are setting the data policy. It's people who are drafting up legislation, uh, statutes that can take years to be, to be passed and enacted. Um, several countries, and again, I'm not talking just in developing nations, but here in Europe, you have laws passed 10 years ago and 10 years later, there's, you know, that you will do this. You will create this infrastructure. And 10 years later, they're still trying to figure out how to do it because it wasn't given enough push from the top, basically. And that's another thing we'll get to at the end on, on suggested solutions. But again, there is no best way to implement an SDI. It depends on the country you're in. It depends on the culture, the information culture. It depends on the information culture of the organizations that have to participate. Um, I've always said that uh, I lecture at, at uh, Dublin Institute of Technology on, on GSDI and SDI and at some of the National Mapping Agency courses. And everybody wanted to focus on the data first. And I said the first part of the course should be on organizational management. You know, take it from the, from the uh, uh, philosophy courses. How do you manage organizations? How do you manage people? Because that's what it comes down to at the end of the day, is getting people who are geared up enough and want to work together to start to make this activity happen. So the main objectives of any SDI are data sharing and interoperability. This was to reduce cost. This was the main driver in Europe. Studies we did back in 2000 until 2003, some big multi-million euro funded projects found out that in, in many, well in most EU country, EU member states, five different organizations might be collecting the same data. Four different government agencies were collecting the same data, often to different standards, and often not exactly the same data, but the same type of data. And this was the point, one of the key drivers financially has always been cost savings through reducing uh, duplicated uh, data collection. And we found exactly the same thing in Namibia, we found it in South Africa, I found it in Turkey, uh, even at regional level in, in Catalan, in, in uh, uh, Spain back in 2000 seven or eight when we did the strategy for the, the Catalan region. So that's a, that is a key issue. The second is permitting reuse of the data. This goes into the policy side. A lot of people say, this is my data. Even in a government that has a sharing mentality, a data sharing mentality, uh, you go to the, the statistics office and you say, I'd like this information to help me do this planning project on the coastal zone over here. Ooh, we can't let you have that. But it says in the law, you've actually got the EU directive in place on sharing data for environmental purposes. And this is environmental data. Oh, I'll have to see about that. And about three months later, you might get access to the data, whereas it should be automatic. Even if it's not harmonized, you need access to the data. So data access is a key issue. And that is also included in the Inspire Directive. There are some guidelines you're supposed to follow. Um, you all know if you've ever tried to get data from some other organization other than your own, that there's also ways <coughs> that it can take a lot of work to get the extra data. One of the studies done at the Bremerhaven University years ago, um, they actually used graduate students on a project. It was 12 graduate students who were asked to collect specific data that they knew existed in city departments in Bremerhaven and from universities and from organizations. And at the end of the study, they all found the data. They got access to the data. 83% of the work on that project was in finding the data and getting access to it. 17% went to using the data. And that's something else you try to get around by having a spatial data infrastructure with laws and regulations and standard data so you can access, find data and access it easily. Um, the original SDI initiatives in Europe didn't start in environment uh, directorate, they started in the information market directorate because the whole point was let's have access to this spatially referenced data to build up the information market because they saw this happening in America. Um, you know, think about your car navigation systems, your tourism systems, your rambler walking systems. This is a way to build new products. 
We spent five years working on it, from 1995 to 1999. Um, and then the regulations changed, or the, the mindset changed, and everything stopped. And we started again about 2005. So it's a way to bring the information together to increase the value of the data. And we'll get to the cost-benefit side later. I wasn't going to include that in, in, in the session today, because nobody wants to talk about cost-benefit studies. But until you can actually show someone Somebody has to pay for this work. Until you can show them that there is a real benefit, financial or otherwise, they're not going to provide the funds to do the work. And if you don't have the funds, it won't get done. Um, a lot of SDIs have started bottom up. Uh, Canada, the Marine SDI, called Marine GDI, started in Canada in 1999, a few years before they started doing the main Canadian uh, spatial data infrastructure. America had the, the coastal, what was, what was then the Coastal Services Center of NOAA started doing tremendous work in it, what, what was a coastal SDI um, about 1999, and yet the American SDI directive from the president didn't come out to 2004. So there are ways to start from the bottom and start working up, and working upwards from different organizations. Key organizations get together, which is what happened in Ireland with the Irish Spatial Data Exchange. Five agencies got together you know, from, from different focuses, and they said, we need to do something to, to share the data, because we do need it. And then later, it gets embedded into a national initiative. But when it comes to legislation, when it comes to statutes and laws and regulations saying, you must do this, that has to come from the top. Because unless it comes from the top, it isn't going to get done. So here's the slide for the main components of an SDI. It's the governance. It's the data policies and principles, the legislation to back up the policies, implementation, which is where you get involved in the harmonization activity, um, uh, the development of applications, uh, and the training, uh, the, the training capacity to get people to use this information, and capacity building generally. It's all down to people. And it's really getting people ready in all different uh, aspects of the implementation to make this work. Typical example here, this was taken from uh, one of the European Environment Agency um, presentations we did some years ago. You've got lots of data coming in from Earth Observation, in situ, data modeling coming in from agencies and research institutes. It's feeding into lots of different components uh, you know, that are all used by different agencies to do things like WFD is the Water Framework Directive. This has been in existence since 2000, so people had to respond to the Water Framework Directive. You've got the navigation customer base everything to do with marine navigation, which is IHO's responsibility, and the National Hydrographic Organization. You've got the ICZM customer base on the right-hand side, shoreline impact, sediment cell mapping. I mean, if you did this properly, you couldn't fit it on 10 screens because there's just so many activities that take place. And the key was to, with an SDI, is to find a way to mix and match all this data. To have the data, to have the models, to be able to bind the data to an application and make it barely automatic as automatic as possible, including the access rights. So the traditional way to implement an SDI, you have an information policy, and later on, a spatial data infrastructure policy, because that's always the way it's developed. You have to find the data sets that fit within this policy, and you have to, you have to create metadata so other people can find those data sets. And here's where it needs to be standardized, hopefully using an open standard. You then have to publish the metadata to make it discoverable. That's part of the new, uh, the revised Public Sector Information Directive here in, in Europe, um, 2013, 10 years after the initial one, saying not just that you have to tell people what you have, you have to let them know what you have electronically, online, using standards. That's where the Data Discovery Service comes into play and where OGC became so important, the Open Geospatial Consortium on, this, on the spatial side, because they developed the web services. It's a specification for almost all the different web services, many of which are now embedded in SDI initiatives and or our ISO standards. They've been taken on board by ISO. Then you have to publish your data to make it uh, either, at least viewable, not just discoverable, but viewable. Quite a lot of data is viewable, but you can't download it. That gets into uh, problems with uh, intellectual property rights and different governments having different attitudes to open data. It can be a real issue. It's a serious issue. Then you have to support that data delivery. This is where you need new resources. Uh, and then eventually, and very few people have done this yet in the SDI world, you need to review what, what happened. What was the real cost benefit? Sometimes they do a cost benefit to start an SDI. Sometimes they just do it because they feel it's a good thing to do. 
Um, very few countries have actually come along five or ten years later to do a cost-benefit study to see how good it is. Maybe for an individual section or an individual government, uh, an individual department, but not for an entire um, uh, SDI. In fact, we've had studies going back to 2006 with the Joint Research Center. It's almost impossible to do a cost-benefit study for a whole SDI or any really big information infrastructure. We'll see that a bit later. So the main policy drivers are to increase, the, increase operational efficiency, to share services, government to government, government to business, business to government, and government to citizen, etc. cetera. Um, everybody should have access to this information so that developers can come up with innovative new applications that run on your mobile phone or somewhere else if it requires location-based information. Uh, help the information economy grow. This is why it started you know, back in 1995 at the Information Market Directorate at the Commission. It had to do with if we have more access to data and more people can use that data to develop new services and new systems, it will not only benefit people who use the systems, it will create new business. And business will create new taxes. It isn't life going to be wonderful. Um, there were so many assumptions built into the very early cost-benefit studies we did for Inspire starting back in 2000, that you had to be really one of the believers to believe a lot of the assumptions, even though everybody, I think, knew in their, in their heart that it was a good thing to do this. It was very hard to come up with, with hard numbers. Um, and of course, the, the biggest intangible is enable better decision making. I'd like somebody to accept you can find individual cases where if you had the right data, you could have made a better decision but you'd have to factor in thousands of those decisions to actually come up with a number that was meaningful to the Ministry of Finance who's being asked for 300 million euro to implement the SDI or 200 million euro or 10 million euro. That's part of the problem. The main SDI policies, and this, is, this applies to information broadly, um, are accessing the data, using and reusing the data, and charging for data or not charging for data. I know there's a huge open data drive across government now uh, governments globally, which didn't exist even five years ago. And in some countries, like in the UK, where major producers of data, the mapping agency, the environment, not the environment agency, the hydrographic service, the admiralty, they're all trading funds. They have to earn hundreds of millions a year from their activities. The government doesn't give them any tax money. You don't get free data in places like that. And that's part of the problem. And then if you need that data, if you're doing a regional project where you need some access to some UK data and maybe some Danish data and, and Dutch, you know, Dutch data, etc., theirs will all be free, but theirs you have to pay for. And if you're going to do a project, you need to know that in advance so you can build it into the budget for the project. So the charging or not to charge debate is, is ongoing. Um, Professor Mike Blake and I wrote a book on this in 2004, I think, and not much has changed since then, except the, the new drive to try to free up more data at government level. Because now further studies have been done to show that it is beneficial. In almost every case, it is beneficial to the government, to the country, if you free up government data so other people can have access to it to build new applications. A government department has a legal mandate to do a certain number of things. They don't have a mandate to spend, spend time and money doing new applications using that data. That's where the rest of us come into, into play, if we can have access to the data. And then we have the, the burgeoning role now of unofficial data, crowdsourced data. You all know about OpenStreetMap. There's also OpenOceanMap. Um, even the International Hydrographic Organization now has documentation guidelines on uh, crowdsourcing data. So they have official trusted nodes, you know, cruise ships and, and cargo ships who collect data, because only about 15% of the ocean bottom has ever been monitored. Uh, recorded bathymetrically at all you know, and since 1903 or something when the IHO was set up. So there is a role for unofficial sources. The big debate then becomes if I have a law in place that says I have to use the official data set, but I've also got an equivalent data set that was collected by people, including other government agencies, the law says I have to use the official data set, for example, with cadaster and, and registers, when in fact there could be a better data set from someone else. In Catalonia, back in 2007, 2007, when we did the strategy in Catalonia, the municipality, don't forget, Catalonia has got 10 million people. It's bigger than some EU member states, so it's not a little region. Uh, it's a financially important region. Government bodies at community level were, were told they can't use, you know, street line data, et cetera, from Navtech, you know, the ones that you have built into your, into your GPS systems. They had to use their own data. 
And three years later, the rule changed. You must use the data that comes from Nat Tech. We do a, an umbrella purchase contract because they had much better data because of their business model than they ever had locally at that level. So the, the unofficial, and that was still unofficial data, but it was better than anything they had otherwise. The other parts of the policy that are often forgotten are custodianship of the key reference data, um, the voluntary or mandatory participation in the SDI. If it's mandatory, then you have to have some sort of enforcement. If it's voluntary, it doesn't necessarily work. Several years ago, um, back in, in 2004, 5, 5, 6, America NSDI policy was failing. So they developed this concept of the national map, which became known as TNM, the national map. They would encourage every level of government to make data available to the national map using FGDC metadata standards so you could find it. Um, it was supposed to have a payback. It was going to cost $2 billion over, I don't know, um, eight or nine years. But the payback would start 12 years later. It would be worth billions and billions of dollars. It started. Some people found the time to implement some data under the national map. And then the whole thing started to die a death around 2006, 2007. It's now been revamped and revised, and it is starting to, to work again. But you had to, the only people who came on board initially are those who actually understood that having access to a national mapping database, not just federal data, which is all that was covered by the NSDI in America, only federal data. You've got 3,000 counties in America in 50 states, and you've got hundreds of government organizations had nothing. They were not covered at all by the presidential executive order which is about 90% of the data you really needed if you were trying to work in a certain area. So there have to be ways to bring in the, the unofficial data as well at, at that point. And then you need financial support. When the Inspired Directive was issued in 2007 and finally adopted 2009, one of the uh, premises in the, in the thing is there is no new money. You all have to do all of these things. And the implementation uh, directive that came out, the implementation regulation, 187 pages in 22 languages, and how you have to do all of this stuff in future, involved no new money from the European Union. A lot of money did come in through funded projects, individually funded projects, where you had maybe four or five countries working together in the coastal zone or on a river basin. So there was. Uh, even as far back as 2009, when we did one of our GSDI presentations, the Joint Research Center and a few others of us did a study, they had already funded 480 million euro worth of activities related specifically to developing SDI across Europe. That was nine years ago. And late projects are still ongoing, getting funding from the EU under the, to either the regional program or the research technology development program to help implement these activities. So now what is the, where does the Marine come into it? Well, it's a subset of the NII. It's a subset of the NSDI, obviously, because it has to do with, with marine data, coastal data. And coastal brings in a real complex situation because coastal data is not just the marine aspect. It's the land aspect. Uh, 1999, we ran a big conference in Nordvik out uh, at a thing called Coast. 1999. It was some funded project. And we looked around. There wasn't a single... Britain is a pretty big coastline in Scotland and Wales and Ireland. There wasn't a single manager who was called a coastal zone manager. It didn't exist. If you wanted to manage a new project in the coastal on a coastal city, a coastal area, you got a bunch of people together and you worked on the project. But it wasn't, there wasn't a single focus on that. It's getting a little better today because people are starting to recognize the value of the coastline and the value of marine data. But it comes down again to being a people question. Who leads the initiative? The, some of the failures I've seen are long delays in implementing an SDI. For example, in Turkey, they, they developed a law. We developed a strategy for Turkey in 2010. Um, everything was approved, and then it took about five years until something really started to happen because everybody was fighting over who should control the SDI. Should it be agriculture? Should it be water? Should it be environment? And they eventually created a cabinet-level post for the SDI to get around all of this. So this is the person who's now in charge of the SDI, and they're making progress. So those are the organizational people or issues that come into play. The four pillars of SDI, marine SDI, the governments, the governance, which is people-based, the technical standards, the information systems, and the geographic data content. So they're all important, but they all have different ways of being accomplished. They have different requirements for being accomplished. The main drivers are still, this is from a presentation we did in 2016, I think. It's still climate change. It's using resources. 
It's looking after maritime policy, including the, the new focus on marine spatial planning. Um, you, you need data from lots of different places to, to look after these activities. And that's why it's so complex, certainly working in the coastal zone. I wish I'd picked forestry or something 25 years ago and not coastal zone because this, so much comes into play in the coastal zone that doesn't exist in other, in other thematic areas. And one of the biggest drivers that's getting money behind it now is the blue growth, this whole focus on blue growth, all the different things that happen uh, in the ocean and in the coastal environment. Uh, from fisheries, fisheries minister, uh, um, mineral extraction, energy extraction, uh, these have hundreds of millions, probably tens of billions of euro are being spent every year in these areas. And this is why it's become a big driver. And people are saying, we're creating all this data. We have new data. What more can we do with it? So what data do you need? This is from the Norwegian SDI, NSDI. And Norway is interesting in that its mapping agency is also a hydrographic organization. So they have seen from uh, long ago, or certainly further long ago than most people, that the marine world and the, and the land-based world, you know, interact. Um, the base geo data, this isn't all of it, on the left-hand side, it's got you know, properties and buildings, roads, railways, elevation, which includes bathymetry, photographs, etc. And then they had the underpinning role of hydrography. This came out of the hydrographic section of the, the, the uh, Danish, of uh, the Norwegian society. And it's looking at flood areas, population, uh, land cover, biology, economy, health, etc. Let's look at the U.S. data themes, because one of the things we did in Inspire in the early days, back in 2002 and three, before it even became a communication, we started looking what other people were doing. What is base data? Within UNGGIM, there's now a working group that's trying to come up with what is the base data. You know, what is the minimum base data, the basic reference data we need to implement SDI across the whole of Europe and across the whole of the globe? So you've got obvious ones there. The ones that are obviously most interest to us, shoreline, bathymetric data, hydrography, marine boundaries. Um, this being very federal land ownership status, this has to do with marine cadaster. Yeah, there's been a big focus on that in the States. And this, this was all developed back in, the, what, 20 years ago, this whole concept. These sort of themes were being looked at 20 years ago. Um, wetlands, etc. Now, I am not going to go through every one of those data themes for you. This is part of your homework. They're all in the presentation. Uh, but what I've done is actually then state in the, these next three slides why this data is so important for the coastal marine community and why it needs to be involved. Uh, the people who are in, in charge of this data needs to be involved. And it hints out some of the, the legal issues. You know, federal statutes only go so far in America or in Germany. The rest of it goes down to states or lander. The lander is how they implement things. So there's an organizational aspect to all of this as well. Um, marine boundaries are obviously becoming more important now because of the marine cadaster. And it's marine boundaries that were the first driving force for marine cadaster. A lot of the early studies coming out of Australia uh, from University of Melbourne, where there was a real center of excellence on this, it was basically about boundaries. There wasn't much else involved. Um, there is now a a marine cadaster group being developed within, well, there's a boundary group that already exists at IHO for the new S100 standards. They've only produced three standards so far in the series, and one of them is marine boundaries. But when you talk to them, I went to one of the presentations last summer over in, in England, and they admitted, yes, it's all about marine boundaries, but it's not really too much about the water column itself. You've got the depth now, you've got the boundaries of the depth, but not what's taking place there. And that's what you need for cadastral information. The whole point of cadaster is rights and responsibilities, what's happening within this boundary. Um, but now, how did they actually go about this? The coastal SDI, which was what they still call it, the coastal SDI, developed in the States, was within the National SDI Initiative, uh, led by the Federal Geographic Data Committee, which is a, has existed since 19, early 1990, uh, 1992, I think. They sit on a lot of the subcommittees. They have a formal marine and coastal spatial data subcommittee. And we can ignore the rest of that and go to my person there. If you look at this, yeah, you can just about see this. <coughs> this is the SDI structure. And you'll see about the middle there, it says marine and coastal spatial data subcommittee. And then down below, you have the different working groups that are, that are involved in developing these aspects. Uh, UNGGIM is obviously now involved, and it, it was well supported by uh, the U.S., whether it still is under Mr. Trump, I don't know, but don't blame me for that. I've lived here 42 years now, and I never go back. 
Um, you've got user data, metadata, standards, architecture and technology, and then the national boundaries. So these are the main working groups they have working across all of these subcommittees now. And I say this activity has been going on. The first important national metadata standard it was published by uh, FGDC in 1996, promoted uh, legally in 1998, and then made mandatory by the presidential directive in 2004. And in the early days here in Europe, when we were promoting SDI, we just adopted the FGDC metadata standard for those member states over here who were interested, because it was the only one that, that existed. Later, the Open Geospatial Consortium and ISO you know, teamed up, and we came up with a, a new set of metadata standards, which are now an ISO standard, which also encompasses FGDC. It, didn't, it, it brought it on board. Um, the Inspire data theme. Now, how many of you know about Inspire? Please, let's see some hands. Europe? No, we have, we have a small Europe population here. Infrastructure for spatial information in the European community. The work on it really began in 1995 with a thing called GI 2000. Didn't get fully developed until it became a directive in 2007 and isn't to be fully operational until 2021. So even from the time the directive was published, and it took two years to develop it, 2005 to 2007, we're talking 16 years. Now, it shouldn't take any country 16 years, but we're looking at the whole of the EU, standardization across 28 member states, and it's taking a lot longer. So they set things out in different annexes. There were 34 data themes in three different annexes. Annex 1 uh, and part of Annex 2 had to be implemented early and it had about nine data themes in it. These were the underpinning data themes. Annex 3 had to be done by the end of the whole activity. Most of it is, to be, is being done now, but the final closure date keeps being moved. It was 2019 at one point, then it was 2020. I think now it's 2021 because they're realizing how long it takes to do all of this. Again, within all of the, the 34 data themes, we have some that are directly related uh, to the coastline uh, in marine world, hydrography, protected sites, Area management, especially, actually says including coastal zones, um, regulation zones, uh, marine corridors, transport corridors, you know, for the shipping industry, aquaculture, environmental monitoring, natural risk, oceanographic, geographical features, of course, sea regions, the energy resources and mineral resources. These are considered to be really key uh, marine themes within the 34 data themes that encompass Inspire. The reason I come back to Inspire is that countries outside of Europe are implementing Inspire. Or following it. Turkey, for example, is implementing the whole of Inspire. Namibia, we're following the Inspire, the Inspire directive. Because if you spend uh, tens of thousands of years developing all the work we did to underpin Inspire, getting ready for it, you don't want to throw that away. You learn from their mistakes, so you don't do everything that the Inspire regulations say, but you try to follow as much as possible. And because it is based on internationally agreed standards from ISO now, that's something else that the, the other countries who are implementing take this on board. We might as well use the international standard than, than try to develop a new one of our own. There are also data themes that are not directly related uh, to uh, marine world when you first look at the themes, but they all take they all in, are involved. Geo uh, coordinate reference systems, geographical grid systems. I was in a working group, DIKE, Digital uh, uh, Data Information Knowledge Exchange in Brussels for about three years on implementing the Maritime Strategy Framework Directive, the Bring Strategy Framework Directive. We spent 18 months trying to work out what grid system should be used for reporting purposes for good environmental status. Each country had its own idea. A new idea would come up at the next meeting six months later and then so, yeah, but to do that here is going to be very difficult. We proposed this grid system. So even coming to grips with grid systems can take a lot of extra time. And then you bring in the, the uh, industrial facilities. You have biogeographical reasons, uh, regions, ha habitats. These are all totally relevant in one sense to the marine world. And again, I won't step through all of those. It will be here all day. They're in the presentation, which you have available. Um, so I will say that it does actually, I was on the thematic working group for Inspire Development for area management restriction, regulation zones, and reporting units. We had the, uh, the, the honor of having the longest working group title of any thematic working group at Inspire. And it actually does state coastal zone management, river basin management, regulated fairways at sea. And just a little side comment, an anecdote on getting people involved. The working group, the thematic working group, on paper had about 30 members from across Europe. Practically, there were maybe 12 of us 
who actually went to the meetings and did the development work, developed the schemas, uh, traded them with other groups that had, the, there were only about 12 of us. Six of those 12 were marine, had marine backgrounds. So a lot of the focus on this when it came out and the, the use cases and the, and the examples at the end had to do with the marine world. You know, not the agricultural world, which has a lot of regulated zones as well. And this is the problem of getting the right people involved in the development side of the activity. Um, let's, I think in the end, oceanographic, geographical phys features and sea regions were combined into one specification. I mean, the sea regions really had to do with, with the boundaries, and the oceanographic data was everything occurring in the ocean. So just to save time, over, over time, uh, starting about four or five years ago, they started to be combined. And there is still a very quite active user group. There's, a, there's an implementation body for Inspire. And one of the more active ones, because I'm on two or three of them, is the one relating to the, to the sea regions and the ge geographic areas. I won't go into all the indirect, except when you see things like grid systems, which doesn't sound very marine. It is marine when you have to start using them at coastal level to report or offshore. Um, land cover is important. One of the slides later on points out there's a huge eutrophication uh, site in the Gulf of Mexico in, in America every year. Tens of thousands of square kilometers, eutrophication. The satellite pictures, the Gulf of Mexico is putrid green, right? Now, is that a coastal zone problem? Or is that a problem for the farming communities in Minnesota and Iowa, where I'm from, 3,000 kilometers away from the Gulf, where all the fertilizer is running off and ending up in the Gulf? And that's where they say that the coastal zone isn't this little strip of land. The coastal zone can be the whole country, and not just the next 50 kilometers. It can be the whole country has an impact on this. So it makes it more complicated than on getting people together. Not many people would think from the coastal marine community that we need better fertilizer use regulations to help protect the Gulf of Mexico. But you do. That's how it works out. And again, having this data available, widely available, helps you make a case for doing that sort of activity. Um, human health and safety, and, and safety. Pathogens occurring offshore, for example, in selfish, have a direct impact on health and safety. Almost every data theme you look at does have a marine coastal component to it. When you look at the different impact it can have on the, on the community or on business or on the government, but especially on the people. We won't do indirect. That's again on this slide. So, you've now been well introduced to SDI. Well, partially introduced to SDI. One of the pieces of homework you have uh, at the end of the session is a questionnaire that I've been using for about 17 years now, since we started doing SDI, asking you what your perception is of SDI. What parts of an SDI do you think are most important? Actually rank them. Um, and then give us a little bit of information about yourself. We don't need your name. Just, you know, are you a researcher? Do you work for government? Uh, some background. And we're, we've been collecting these things. We've got about 250 of these now, uh, trying to put together a research paper on what, not what, some academic researcher says about SDA, not what some government says, but what people say, the people who would be involved in implementing the SDI, what they know and say about SDI. And we'll, we'll publish all of that sometime next year, if we can find the right, the right magazine. But SDI challenges, who's in charge or responsible for the SDI? Who coordinates and enforces the implementation of the SDI? And then who pays and who benefits and by how much? These are the key questions that have bogged down so many starts for SDI at national level or delayed them for years until these, until these questions are answered. This is an example from the EEA, um, just typically showing how, what you would like to see in a, in a coastal and marine SDI. You've got a range of government of data services. You've got the International Hydrographic Organization with its reporting requirement. Uh, you've got the EEA with this environmental reporting requirement. You've got a lot of uh, web services up in the right-hand corner providing data to other people. And you can't do any of this unless you can do it, but you can't do it at least cost unless you've got some sort of infrastructure in place, including registers, controlled registers that anybody can access stating where the data is and what the standards are. Because if you're working in a giant and you find out that, hey, this, this department over here has access, a data I might need, or you're doing a joint coastal project between two coastal states and they have some data I might need, you need to be able to access that data. You need to know about it. 
And the IHO is maintaining its own registry under S100 under um, for all of the hydrographic data. We'll I'll talk about how S100 is different from the previous IHO standards a bit later. But the main challenges, we've already touched on some of these, to me is consultation, cooperation, collaboration, and coordination. Everybody likes to have a, the four C's, a keyword. You need to get this in place. You need to have policies even relating to these four C's before you can start. Then you need to raise awareness, especially of the benefits. People can sort of realize what the costs are going to be, but they have to start understanding what the benefits will be. Overcoming skill shortages. Um, some, some governments, Ireland had a problem. They simply could not, did not have the people in, involved to actually could do the extra work relating to the SDI, the harmonization. And they had a ban, after the financial crisis in 2008, they had a ban on hiring any more consultants from outside the departments. So basically, they still had to try to fit this into their own job. So everything has taken a lot longer than expected. Um, you've got to convince the stakeholders that the harmonized geospatial data will help them, not just the people who can now access their data, right? And they will have benefits by accessing other people's data. And then building these innovative new services. As I said, most, legal, most government departments have a legal mandate to do a job or a number of jobs, and they have legally mandated data sources they need to do that. Now, under Inspire, those are all being harmonized now, more or less. That's the concept. So it makes it easier for them to do their job. But there's this transition period where they're sort of doing two jobs. Um, managing expectations. It's like Asmat Ali's director. I want an SDI in six months. Um, I was uh, in, I guess when we did Namibia in 2015, the lead uh, author, or the, the lead government representative for the statistical office, who has the, has the lead on this, he was very pragmatic. We built up this huge work plan, strategic plan. It published a book about 60 pages thick. We did cost-benefit studies. And then I said, well, how are you going to go? Because they're following the Inspire plan. He said, we're going to spend the next three years just focusing on metadata. We're not going to try to put in an SDI. We're going to find out which government agencies have what data, and then get it harmonized and get it published online and openly shared, and then we'll move on to actually harmonizing the data sources themselves. So they're all following. If they're collecting similar data, they're using the same standard, and maybe then we can reduce data duplication. They're looking at seven, eight years. And this is typical. This, you're building a new infrastructure that involves hundreds of organizations at national level and, and tens of thousands of people. It doesn't happen quickly. But it's hard to walk into a, a, the first meeting and developing your SDI with a bunch of cabinet people sitting around, as we did in Ireland, and say, yeah, it's 2005. Well, if you're lucky, you'll be done by 2020. This isn't what they want to hear. They want quick wins and all the rest. So we try to focus on a few quick wins. Cadaster raises money in most states. So if we do cadaster first, you'll actually have easier way to collect more money. Um, something like that. Then how do you measure the success? You've, you've developed some win-win cases. What are the performance indicators? There's a whole body of research on performance indicators for SDI. And they are different than a performance indicator for a single project. Yes, it's easy to do a project, but you would have to do hundreds of projects that are all being made more efficient somehow because of the SDI to build that into an SDI benefit. And finally, adapting to change. You know, we all live in the world. The stuff we were talking about 1995 when we started GI 2000 and 2002 when we started on Inspire, everything has changed since then. We didn't even have ISO standards back when we were first talking about harmonized data and even harmonized metadata. And now we have technology sitting on your desk and sitting in my pocket you know, that are far superior to the sort of computer access we had uh, 15 years ago. And that keeps changing. So... Why do we have these challenges? Capacity building issues. This has to do with humans having the resources to actually learn the skills to work with the data and users learning the skills to work with the data. Some of the more successful parts of SDI that have been implemented are where they've concentrated on the external user base, not the government data, not, not the research academic data, but how are people going to use this data? And the commission is funded I was involved with two. They probably funded 50 million euro worth of projects, part funded in the last uh, six or seven years, specifically on applications, projects to develop applications that use location data, wide ranges of applications, which then hopefully when the project ends, typically after three years, are made available either for free or, or, or to governments to give away or whatever. Um, unfortunately, for most 
EU-funded projects, there isn't too much follow-up after a project finishes. So you never really know how big an impact it had at the end of the day. I can say that now because I don't do any more consulting with the EU, so it's all right. Um, conflicts with other departments. This has to do with this, who's going to actually lead the initiative? And I mentioned Turkey as an example. Um, it's actually been mentioned in papers, so I'm not letting out any secrets. There was, there was a real issue on who should be in charge of implementing the SDI when they start to realize it's a very important infrastructure to be in charge of, equivalent to being in charge of the water infrastructure you know, or the agricultural regulation. So somebody, everybody wants to be involved. And it's not just the mapping agencies anymore, not just a topographic mapping agency. That's just the underpinning data you need for location-based data. Very important. But they have no remit to do anything else for those other data themes we've been talking about in most countries. Um, concerned over data quality. This was a big problem we had, or a problem we had in Ireland. They didn't want to free up their data to make it openly available because there might be errors in it. And the minute you start publishing your data online beyond your own legally mandated data needs, uh, somebody phones you, hey, this data's wrong. My house isn't there. My monument's not there. You know, this road center line, we changed this two years ago for the Department of Transport. And so you have this concept, fine. The principle to involve is the more people who see your data and find errors in it have a mechanism where they can tell you about it easily and correct the data. Otherwise, you have to go correct the data because you're now using wrong data to do your job. And that is slowly catching up. But there's still a lot of this, my data, nobody else sees it, and one of the driving factors is it could be wrong. That's the data hoarding side as well. Um, official data versus the unofficial data. We'll talk about crowdsourcing a bit later. Crowdsourced data is becoming much more important and actually acceptable in a lot of cases now. Even Ordnance Survey in Great Britain is supposed to be the most digitized mapping agency in the world. You know, 50,000 changes to their database every day. They have about 200 surveyors left in, in, in Ordnance Survey, in OSGB. Everything is outsourced. To companies, or to companies who do the survey work following a standard. Now, it's actually crowdsourced in one sense. It is an ordinance survey staff who in the old days did all of this work. They had 3,200 people at one point, but now it's companies doing the work following a standard. So they said, if you're going to be one of our contractors, here's the standard, collect the data this way. So it's sort of what I call halfway outsourced, halfway official. It becomes official data, but it's not being done by the organization itself. And the biggest change or one of the bigger issues is institutional inertia. People don't want to change. You start making a presentation like this, even in reduced format, to the heads of some departments and a single, you know, a single agency, you know, oh, God, we have to do this and we're going to have to get this and we have to train these people and we're going to need more money. And so we aren't going to do anything for a while, which is why a lot of these initiatives start, maybe even have a regulation or a statute, and then nothing happens for 10 years because somebody really has to become a champion and take this on board. One of the problems we had at Inspire, as I mentioned the thematic working groups, was getting the experts involved from the marine coastal community in the different thematic working groups to make sure that the marine coastal aspect was covered. And about the only thematic working groups, except for the one I mentioned, where by accident half of us were made up from the marine community, were hydrography, of course, had hydrographers in it. A lot of them were land-based hydrographers. They weren't coastal, they weren't marine hydrographers. They were people that look after hydrologists, basically. Um, you had the sea regions had some marine people in it, oceanographic, but only maybe four thematic working groups actually had you know marine people in a key position in developing the Inspire data specification for that theme whereas they should have been involved in lots of the other themes as well, like biotopes and species distribution, et cetera. Because you have a lot more trouble managing species distribution in the ocean than you do looking at species di distribution in a national park, where you're trying to see how many ferrets have been introduced from you know, invasive species. Um, it didn't happen. And then getting people to proactively participate, not just go to a meeting and maybe read a, read a document, very short. We were told to keep our documents to two pages, two A4 pages, to raise an issue. Uh, don't give them a 20-page book or, or a presentation like this because you need to focus them on the thing they can do in the next X weeks or X months and then keep that going. But that has to be coordinated. Somebody has to coordinate that level of, of participation. Um, and then getting the message out to the marine communities. I think because the marine community has its own way of talking, you know, the coastal community, we've been running Coast GIS conferences since 1995, Tanya, I guess. Yeah, the first one in our, so we've, we've been doing that for 23 years now. Um, we got the uh, 
uh, Marine Information Management Working Group here at the IOC. You've got lots of people exchanging information. So from the Marine point of view, we're, we're better than most. So what have we learned? And this isn't what I've learned, this has taken, we've taken from lots of different applications, uh, presentation that other people have made in implementing their SDIs. Human resources are the most difficult challenge, right? Certainly in Europe. Finding the experts to come in to do the job, both in the setting it up and then later in the implementation. Um, the experts we've used come from disparate communities. They don't even speak the same language. It's hard to get them to understand each other. Or why should this be important to you? It's not important to me. And you've got six, ten of them sitting in the room developing a new standard, and they, just, they can't even agree on that. Looking at some of the key problems and finding ways, identifying real organizational ways to overcome those key problems. It is the organizational issues that are still a real mess. And that involves the human resources is all part of that. Finding a champion. You have to find somebody who's willing to push for this. In America, they had President Bill Clinton, Executive Order 1994. Let's do something. It didn't lead to, it, it needs a lot of expansion, but at least you had a president saying, let's do something. In Europe, for five years, we had the director of a directorate for information market in Luxembourg who thought it would be an important part of the information market till he realized that more money was spent or collected on movies just in the UK than the projections we had for the sale of geographic information across the whole of Europe. In fact, we had 15 member states then. And he said, this is stupid. And basically, they stopped. After four years, we spent about two and a half million euro on expert meetings and putting together draft communication, and he just said, this is stupid. And it wasn't until we had the three commissioners who got on board. Uh, from Sweden, the environment uh, uh, minister, uh, we had the Joint Research Center, and we had the statistical office. The, those three commissioners finally agreed, yes, this is important in 2002, and then something started to happen. And I say, this was all done. They all agreed this in 2002. We had a directive in 2007, five years later. It still took time. So we have to have a champion. If you don't have a champion, it's not going to happen. And then information dissemination to all the stakeholders. This is, this is getting people on board. When we do presentations like this in countries that are just starting, uh, we have big meetings. 50, 60, 70 people come for a day. We have breakfast on arrival. We have lunch. They can even stay for dinner. Uh, we have six or seven presenters from around the government talking about their concerns and aspects. It's getting the information flow started, making personal contacts, and then keeping in contact with those people and publishing re regular newsletters on what's happening and where the problems exist. So this is one of these quotes from the U.S. Commission. The coastal zone is not a narrow band. It's the whole country. And certainly in coastal areas, it's a country that goes far inland. Now, we talked about the, the four pillars. That's fine. You've got all these policies to be developed. You've got government structures. You've got the technical standards, uh, I, all the IT stuff, um, and, the, and then all the content, which is where all the data harmonization comes into place. What else do you need? Ah, well, you need a few other things. The guidance notes on how to do these different activities, official notes that tell people what's expected and how they can proceed, literature, wikis, different knowledge bases, training programs, the mentoring from experts, people who have actually done this somewhere else before, best practice, capability building, and capacity building. So capability building is, is part of the training activity, letting people learn what they have to know to participate if they don't already know it. And we do a lot of train the trainers stuff here. And then the capacity building afterwards. It's no good for a trainer to come back into the Department of the Environment in a country and say, oh, we, we need to do this, and I need five new people who can do this. And the guy says, fine, go find them. You know, I can't give you any budget, but if you need them, go find them. Maybe they'll do it for free. So that is all built into the capacity building side. Various studies have been done um, on how you overcome this. This was a study done in, in, uh, in, U in the UK in July 2010, but it was done by an Australian company, ACL, ACIL Tasman. So it had a global aspect to it as well. They found the top barriers were lack of awareness of the benefits, resistance to change among the users, implementation costs or fear of the implementation costs. And a couple of the simple CBA examples I'll show later, they don't have to be high if you're only focusing on the SDI aspect, not all the data collection, but just the harmonization aspect. Um, inappropriate data pricing, uh, and this also being produced in the UK, this all had to do with the trading funds, everybody charging for their data, and restrictions on access, not just access, but reuse. You've got access to the data for me, and then what can I use it for, and then what can I reuse it for? 
Can I build it into a new application that might have eight or nine data sources coming into it, not just the one I got from you, so I can make a new application? That's what application developers need. Almost every case, they need access to four, five, six, ten data sets before they can do their application properly. And if they can get those in a harmonized way, that's fine. Uh, if they had open data uh, uh, sources, fine. Even if they had to pay for some of the data, but they have a way to do that so that they know what the rules are, everything is online, they can actually do online licensing, then they can develop the application. A lot of applications we've developed over the last 15 years in the, in the SDI and Marine SDI here in Europe on these projects, receiving hundreds of millions of euro, they only had access to the data during the project, the erosion project, the erosion study we did back in oh, 15 years ago now, you know, looking at the whole cost and benefit of monitoring ero uh, erosion, coastal erosion around all the coastal states. Yes, excellent. They did some great work, great modeling, great access to data sets. When it finished, they had access to about three data sets. All the other data sets they no longer had access to because they were only given access for the project team during the life of the project. So access is still a real restriction and in both you know, use and reuse. And then the implementation strategies, there's no point like the, the national map exercise in America uh, done by FGDC, they show up and they say, we need the national map. Over the next uh, three years or four years, we're going to have to pay some people. We have to pay the, the counties and the cities to participate. The whole thing is, or they're going to have to come up with their own money. It's going to cost about $2.3, $2.4 billion. But 10 years from now, the benefit to the country is $6 billion or $8 billion a year forever. We're going to do this. Great. Fantastic return on investment, um, but nobody had $2 billion to put into it. And one of the studies we did with, uh, or one of the projects we looked at for a, a way of measuring the value of intangible assets for NASA, new database, it's going to cost $6 million. Um, the cost is all front-loaded, and then we get $12 billion worth of, of benefit in following years. They can't do that. They do an annual budgeting cycle. They can't ask for $6 million in that first year. Right? So they actually can't commit to the whole project. So you have to fit into the budgeting project. You have to understand what the, what the requirements are of the financial contributors. And there's a link there to the, uh, to the study that most of this comes from. It, it's still, it says 2010. It's just as relevant today as it was when it was written. So what are some recommendations? First of all, and we've done this most recently, is tie your SDI development, marine or otherwise, into e-government initiatives. Quite often, we found this in country after country, there would be a massive amount of work going on on e-government. Right? I'm talking Ireland, I'm talking Namibia, South Africa, Turkey, huge e-government activity going on. No connection at all to what was being done in the spatial data infrastructure. They were actually developing different standards in some cases, including the UK. Right? So you need to, you need to find out where you fit within the whole picture of a national information infrastructure. Because a lot of the work you're planning on doing may already have been done or is being done or you should be involved in helping them define the specifications. So that's, that's one aspect. Um, set some realistic timelines for the implementation. I know it's difficult to go to a finance directorate, a ministry, of a, a treasury department and say, oh, we're going to need, you know, by our cost benefit analysis, 22 you know, million euro, dollars, pounds, whatever, over the next six years, and then we're going to get some real payback after that. Um, yes, they do invest in infrastructure all the time. If you were building a new road, they'd say, fine, go ahead. If you were extending an airport, fine, go ahead. But you're doing an information infrastructure. And until you educate them on what the value of that is in the long term, it's very difficult to get that money uh, agreed up front. Find some win-win scenarios. What we found in most places, it had to do with cadaster. In fact, when we went to Catalonia to do this, they had a, a royal decree that had been issued in 2000, I guess, eight or nine. We were there in 2000, no, it was 2007. It was that long ago. God, I'm getting old. Um, they had a, the cadaster was maintained by a completely different government department than the mapping agency, ICC, right? They had the official maps. They had official boundaries of everything. The official boundaries were different than the official boundaries that the other department held for cadaster. And fortunately, one of the senior, senior officials at, at the Generalitat in Catalonia realized this is stupid. He was a geographer. He was a former geographer. So they spent two years merging the boundaries. So they ended up with one boundary set that both of them shared. 
So at least you had it done. And this was a, we found that they were very advanced in their SDI concepts and, and initiatives in Catalonia. Um, so you better look at, the, at, at those problems. That, to, to me, was a win-win scenario, which then got them really on board for the rest of the SDI. And then the continuous awareness raising, the training, this has to go on. You know, we need, you need sessions like this with 20 government department people involved. The people who actually have to do the work, and hopefully a couple of managers higher up who have to pay for it all, you know, every three months, every four months at least, and then monitor what's going on with, with uh, capacity building in the meantime. Because until the people know how to start and what to do, it isn't going to get done. This isn't rocket science. It just isn't going to get done. So where do we stop? 12.30? Who pays 12? All right. This is online. And you probably aren't dreadfully concerned about cost-benefit analyses anyway, so we'll wrap this up in seven or, or, or ten minutes. Um, I ended up in Ostend in 2005 because of the Motif project, Marine Overlays on Topography. 2.7 million euro. We were looking at specifically what happens at the land-sea interface, both you know technical side, et cetera, data side, organizational side. I got landed with the work packages to do with cost-benefit analysis because the European Commission at that time requested they actually gave us a separate contract. Can we come up with an agreed cost-benefit analysis methodology that they would that is built into the directive, which they would then require member states to use if they want to use this opt-out, where if you can prove that it's not cost-beneficial for this data set, you don't have to harmonize it. Well, fine, you could come up with any cost-benefit analysis methodology you wanted to prove that it's not viable, and so not waste the time to harmonize it to the Inspire standard. In the end, we never found one, but we found things that worked. Um, first of all, it wasn't just a standard cost benefit. There's a thing called multi-criteria analysis, MCA methodology. Um, that worked better. There's a way of looking at benefits, uh, at cost from a monetary point of view, and benefits at a, at a value, intangible value point of view. And we'll look at that in a second. This is this thing called GeoVMM, the Geo Value Measuring, Measuring Methodology. And this, this came out of America from Booz Allen Hamilton. In the States, if you are a government department, asking for, I think the limit is $10 million or more, you must do a cost-benefit study using three approved methodologies from office, what was the Office of Management and Budget before you can apply for the money. So they're asking you, the Government Accounting Office is saying, show what's up front that it's worth doing this so you don't get the money. And VMM has been accepted methodology for a long time, and then Booz Allen Hamilton were brought on board to do a geo version, a geographic information version of VMM. And we'll, we'll see an example of that. And then what did come out of the Motif project, we actually developed a whole series of spreadsheets you can use to do this sort of analysis, including the, the financial cost and the financial and intangible benefits. Um, but even then, we found that it's, it works for big projects. It doesn't necessarily work for a whole SDI. But if you can show that it works for enough big projects, when somebody's asking for finance for a bigger sum of money, then you can actually start to point the direction, well, yes, this would be a good thing if we implemented the whole of the SDI. Um, I guess one problem we came up, or you always find in any CBA, any cost-benefit analysis, is the assumptions. You always have to make assumptions. Costs can be reasonably well estimated. Benefits, you make a lot of assumptions. If we do this, better decision-making in road transport is going to be worth 10 million euro or 10 million dollars or 10 million whatever. Um, well, that's fine if you've got something to support that number, but if the people who are lending you or giving you the money for the development don't believe that assumption, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to give you the money. So this is one thing. Uh, if you try to make something that's just too complicated, so you can't make a, a finance agency, a treasury department or whatever, or the, the financial controller in your own agency, if they are given a document this thick, they have to wait through to see what the answer is because you've come up with a lot of strange ways of, of showing benefit. They're just not going to read it. There's another sort of, of uh, analysis called the cost effectiveness analysis, which is really what it comes down to. A lot of what we do with SDI is we make things more effective to use. And so cost effective analysis can be a better way of, of moving forward. So GeoVMM, great, it works. It has a way of valuing intangible left benefits using access to hundreds of stakeholders who, who actually assign a value to an intangible benefit. But because of that, um, you're getting expert input and you're getting stakeholder input, 
You can apply weighting factors to the different benefits. You can bring in risk factors. It's all wonderful, um, except it's a very time-consuming and expensive process. So you'll find your financial institution wants a good cost-benefit analysis and want a really good answer, but they don't want to pay for it. In fact, we were we were part of we tendered for a contract in Ireland three or four years ago to do a CBA for the Irish SDI, um, and we, we have, I've been I've been working in Ireland and with Ireland since 2005, so we were fairly well placed to suss out what was going to happen. And I said uh, I had a little meeting. I said, okay, uh, what's the budget like? Because they will tell you, and they said, oh, it's 25,000 euro. I said, you want us to do a cost-benefit analysis for the whole of Ireland for the spatial data infrastructure for 25,000 euro. I mean, there's individual projects do this for about 250,000, and they fail because that isn't enough to get all the experts involved. You need to really invest in that if that's what you mean. And if you're not willing to invest a reasonable sum of money in something that has a big cost and a huge payback, then there's no point in starting. So we, we actually dropped out of the, uh, out of the bidding. There's also strategic different values. So there's also financial value, which is cost savings and cost avoidance by not duplicating data. That's fine. You can put numbers to that if people are keeping their costs on record in their departments. Um, closer working relationships, improved decision making. Well, yes, if you can improve decision making, it has a value. But it's hard enough to put a single monetary value on that unless you do it across a whole range of decision making. And look at bad decisions that were made. This is a good way to bad decisions made because of bad data and what the extra cost was. If you could obviate that in the future, it would be useful. Um, the drawbacks. It's an expensive methodology. uses lots of experts. It uses a lot of stakeholder time. You need people to not just get together and listen to you. They have to participate. They have to talk to you. They have to let you know, you know how they feel about their data. Um, it doesn't overcome the problem of assigning monetary value to intangible benefits, but there is a way. I, I haven't brought up the spreadsheets. I'll send you the link. In fact, the spreadsheets we developed are still available online, but not through the IODE, who were the secretariat for the project because it closed so long ago. They got rid of the website. Um, so you can see how you could take all the different aspects of intangible benefits, how you could put weighting factors to them, and essentially you assign a number. So here's the cost. The cost is going to be 3.8 million euro. We're quite convinced of that because we can do the cost analysis. The benefit analysis has a, has a rating of 62 or 98 or 37 or something. And you, you agree beforehand with the financial funder what the cutoff should be for that. And then they have to have faith in, this, in the process so that when the intangible benefits are given a number, they accept that and they take it on board. And that is, again, one of the drawbacks. It's a great system. It's time consuming. It can be a bit expensive. Um, but the funding body, the funding agency, the funding person has to believe in the process. Or else you're going to come up with another great study that nobody's ever going to fund. Three quick ones. Um, just to show what people have used. Croatia did an SDI cost benefit study about two, five, six years ago. And these were the things they looked at. The things, the goals, first of all, what are the goals of your SDI? Raising social awareness, uh, customizing the existing spatial data, using new standards so you can use new technology, uh, designing the metadata to describe the existing spatial data. This is part of your infomet, what we call the information asset register. And then creating a data, ca data catalog and the necessary infrastructure to access that infrastructure, or that catalog. So it wasn't a huge amount of work, but it, you know, very meaningful work. Find out what you have, standardize the metadata, let people have access to it, which is really the role that um, uh, Namibia is following right now, starting from, from a year ago. So the types of costs they looked at, spatial data collection and maintenance costs, material infrastructure, um, customizing the data, human resources, and other costs, which could be as big as all the others put together when they finally added them up. I'm not going to show you the figures because I'm not allowed to. I'll show you what the process was when they went through it. I have some figures on another one in a minute. But again, they actually included spatial data collection and maintenance. So they're saying part of my spatial data infrastructure, SDI cost, is actually collecting all the data. But the data has to be collected anyway under legal mandate. So it isn't really, it, underpay, it is the heart of the infrastructure, but it isn't necessarily a cost of the SDI. It's a cost of doing business as a government agency or, or a, a private agency. The benefits they came up with were reducing redundancy and cost, um, increasing the product and services available, 
and direct and indirect benefits for the whole of society through improving public information services. Now, again, these are the sorts of benefits. You look at these, okay, I can see how I can reduce costs. I can reduce redundancy. Um, I can make a projection on how many new applications I could develop and what their value would be. But how do I you know, value the benefits for the whole of society through improved public information services? This is where you need what we call Delphi groups, groups of experts and stakeholders getting together and trying to put some sort of indicator on that benefit. It may not be a financial indicator, but it has to be some statement that is really important to do. And it's that sort of work that has led to the current drive here for open data, for having more data, open data. And Catalan, when they did the, because they did an early uh, SDC for the region, they found that the... Uh, the role of IDEC, the Catalan SDI, was really just the SDI component, right? They didn't include, it was the added value for SDI. So they looked at the cost over a five-year period. It didn't include creating the topic graphic data. That had to happen whether you had an SDI or not. It's still, still going on. It was responsibility. Uh, nor the direct cost for the physical, technical, technological infrastructure, which was already in place, is certainly in Catalonia. They looked at things like the metadata creation, uh, the new geo services, um, applications that to be developed, and then managing the SDI process. Um, the efficiency and effectiveness benefits were two of the main benefits they were looking at. They actually got numbers to these. So the efficiency benefits were 2.6 million euro per year to actually implement the regional SDI. And the effectiveness benefits, effectiveness savings things were 2.5 million euro a year. And the detail behind this is very detailed. Department, staff, what they do, what they cost, who would have to do this differently, or who would not have to do this in future. So they came up with a, with a fairly, with the cost recovery period based on what it was costing for those added costs was only four months. And then if you threw in the operating costs from 2004 to 2005, the actual cost of operating the SDI after it's created, that paid for itself within six months as well. So the question was, would you make that investment because the investment they had to make was, I think it was only about 2.8 million euro altogether with four 5.1 million euro savings. Would you make that investment based on the assumptions that went into the cost benefit analysis? That's, that's the, real, the real problem. Um, I think I'll stop there. No, you can read these because some of you may not be interested in cost-benefit analyses. And we do have uh, on the website, the, the website, you can download some documents that relate to, to the, the works that were done. But some of the main recommendations we made, prepare a business case, engage the stakeholders, um, discuss with the funding agencies prior to doing a CBA what the budget is likely to be. It's no good going to your finance directorate or even within your own organization saying, we can do this fantastic thing. It's got a return on investment of 400%. You know, benefit cost is 22 to 1, but it's going to cost 8 million euro next year. And he has a good laugh, but he hasn't got 8 million euro next year. So find out what, your, what limit you're working within, and then look at what you could do within that budget, and then build that into your cost-benefit analysis. That was a primary conclusion came out of a three-day workshop we had at the Joint Research Center in 2006. Every, we had people there from around the world, from all countries, not just Europe. And basically it was find out what the money is likely to be available and then uh, do your cost-benefit study. And that they actually have some chance of success then. Um, da, 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 da. I guess here the, the one I would consider on the bottom is the multi-criteria multi analysis. There are Type into Google multi-criteria analysis, and it'll take you to about 10 <coughs> really good background papers on how you do multi-criteria analysis. In a sense, what we did with GeoVMM is something like that. And not only does it look at different criteria for success, but it goes one step further and assigns a score to intangible benefits. So you can actually try to build the benefit side into the, into the better known cost side. Information audits. How many of you work in a government department? government agency, how many an institution where you collect data, use data? How many of you have an information audit of your data resources? If I walked into your organization tomorrow and said, I'd like to see your information asset register, I'd like to see a record of the data sets you use and the metadata and where it's published, 
not many hands going up. Because until you have that, it's hard to even start. And that's where most, most people start, is trying to do the information audit. Um, agreeing the methodologies, working on these assumptions when you're doing the study to get agreement on the assumptions before you do the study and then throughout doing the study. But the key is still the audit. That's what I say in Namibia, what, basically what they're doing is an audit. They're going to take three years to find out all the data sources they have and implement it online using uh, ISO standards, the ISO metadata standard. And why three years? Namibia has only got 2.7 million people. It's not exactly a big country, right? It's got about 11, 12 government agencies involved, you know, along with the topographic mapping agency, which is very proactive. But they're all doing their own job. And a couple of these government agencies we met, they had one IT person or two IT people in the agency. So they're going to have to find ways to actually get this done around something else. I guess don't be too complex. Because I've seen some cost-benefit analyses done for certainly big projects, not SDIs, that where the study ran to 400 pages. They looked at every aspect you could possibly think of. And fine, it made the consultant who got paid to do the study very happy. It probably made the stakeholder who actually engaged the study very happy. But you know damn well that the, the people providing the money aren't going to read a 400-page document. They're going to say, okay, here, here was the assumption, and here's what you said we, you know, the benefit would be. We want that in a one-page, two-page presentation to the senior you know, management, and then we'll actually make a decision on this. And so you don't need to go to huge levels of complexity, especially if when you're making it complex, you're bringing in more and more assumptions every time you're adding another level of complexity to the cost-benefit study. Um, but also, if you're bringing in experts, people like I used to be, I'm retired now, you know, demand some real rigor from these people. Don't just be fobbed off with a similar study they did three years ago in a similar situation, and they've now modified it a bit to give to you, and so they could beat the low budget. You know, that doesn't do anybody any good. And the national map was a case in point on that. So that's where I'm going to stop. We'll do crowdsourcing after lunch. And then a lot of the rest of my presentation, the other 80 slides, we're going to go through very quickly because they were only there for illustrative purposes. But I want to leave you about 30 minutes at the end well, maybe less than that. Um, our homework, or the homework I've got for you, is uh, three questionnaires to fill out, which I like return to either me or, or Claudia by email. We've got doc versions up on the website, on the school website. Basically finding out what you thought you knew about SDI, what you know now, you know, who, who you are, not your names, but are you academic research, a government employee, uh, do you, have you ever been involved in any SDI activity before? And we're trying to build up this, this image. And then later when we do presentations like this, we're not talking about doing this, these as online, as, as online webinars to get more people involved. We'll build those, those questionnaires into the survey document. But a couple of those forums are quite extensive. I mean, they're six, seven pages long, three, four pages long. They ask all the sort of questions you should have in mind about involving yourself, your, your government department, in working on an SDI. And you know, they're for you to take home as well to, if you want to raise this topic when you get back to your own institution. Okay? All right, I'm going to stop now.